Okay, so today we get to talk about WebSocket frames. Today, man, why can't I get the right volume today? Today we'll talk about WebSocket frames, and today is the last day of content that you strictly need for WebSockets. Friday, I'll do all kinds of demos and try to make more sense out of what we're talking about and get a more practical lecture. Then we'll talk about WebRTC after the break. And then I'll spend a whole week with examples of both and uh, just reinforcing anything that's confusing about these two topics. So WebSockets and WebRTC is what we want to talk about for this one. Uh, I'll populate the, the links here. I, I just realized I didn't put any links for WebRTC yet. Uh, and I'll be making the slides over spring break and posting them as they come. Um, I don't mention this enough. I, I keep forgetting to mention it. But the RFCs, this is where the official documentation is for any topic. Uh, related to the web, really, uh, any protocols and stuff, at least back-end stuff, front-end stuff is a, a different thing. But the RFCs, like the RFC for WebSockets, this will tell you everything you want to know about WebSockets. This is everything that is WebSockets. So if you ever have a question about WebSockets, here's that. this is uh, what we'll talk about today, right in the slides, is that uh, it's in here, including... Oh, come on, give it to me. Uh, right here, that GUID, that randomish string that's used for the WebSocket handshake, uh, that's defined by this document. Uh, all, everything that is WebSockets is in here. Same with HTTP. Everything that is HTTP is in that document. There's a separate RFC for multi-part form parsing if you want to know uh, OK, is there actually a new line character at the end of the data or not, or whatever? You go to the RFC, and the RFC tells you the RFCs will have the definitive answer. The browser developers look at the RFCs. The server developers, us, we look at the RFCs. Everybody goes off the RFC. And if we all comply with the RFC, then the internet works. The web works. Um, everything just works, because we're speaking the same language. We're speaking the same protocol. Uh, so the RFC, that's your ultimate source of truth for anything about these protocols. Uh, so everything we're talking about about WebSockets is in there. Most of it comes right from there, including that chart. But there's a lot of text to parse through, so it's nice to have it in slide and lecture form as well. So I can boil down to exactly what's pertinent to you. Good morning, Toldfish. Did Will the school disable Discord during exams? Um, no. The school? I don't even know. I don't even know <laughs> what you mean by that. You want you be to go to Discord and say, "Shut down your servers. We got an exam going on." <laughs> I mean, I guess, but you're just going to use a VPN, like. Yeah, just no Wi-Fi during all of exams week. <laughs> That's, no, that, it's completely infeasible. <laughs> We're just going to walk around the exam rooms, and if you're on your phone, you fail. Like, I don't know what's, what's so wrong about that solution. I and mean, I know some students are clever about it and stuff. And uh, when 18 students have to go to the bathroom at the same time, all of a sudden, we know what's going on. But... We just keep an eye on that. I always, by the way, whenever that happens, I just note down all the names of, of the people who go. And like, I know you're on your phone in the bathroom. We just can't do much to stop you, uh, except watch it on the back end. And then if your exam looks just like somebody else's, well, you fail. Uh, yeah, just call up the CEO. Can you shut down? We got an exam. It's really important. Then, and, and then you all just use Slack or something. It won't even be effective, uh, especially in a course like this. Like I'm showing you how to build chat apps. Like one of you can just deploy your own chat app. How are we going to shut that down? Can you all name the name of the class and teach you <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Considering I have no exams and quizzes in this class, fine. <laughs> if you cheat on one of my exams or quizzes in 312, yeah, you get an A. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's talk about some WebSockets. Uh, so we saw how to establish the connection. That's, oh, I don't have my ring. Uh, 
do we saw how to establish a connection. That's all I have to say about establishing connection. Again, I'll do demos on Friday and show uh, how to generate that except I'll do it manually. Um, but today we want to talk about once we have a connection established, how do we communicate over this WebSocket protocol? How do we send messages? How do we parse messages that we receive? And how do we generate uh, messages to send over the WebSocket connection? Similar to what we did with HTTP, how do we parse a request? And how do we uh, construct a response and send a response? But very different protocols, very different structure. But the same idea, we need to parse and send. Uh, so, And this is the answer. We saw it right from the RFC. Uh, this is right from RFC 6455. Uh, and uh, this is what we're going to talk about all day. So let's buckle in and, and get ready. So we're going to make sense out of all of this. Um, a lot of it isn't too complex until we get to, I, I guess it is kind of complex. I was going to say until we get to the third byte. So I guess just the first two bytes aren't too bad. Once we get to the third byte, there's quite a bit to talk about uh, to to talk about uh, how exactly this is constructed. Uh, but like I said last time, there's not a whole lot of overhead at all. At most, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, bless you, 14 bytes of overhead before you get to your payload. 14 max bytes in all the headers. These are lightweight messages. Uh, 14 bytes, we have that right in the request line of an HTTP request. We got at least 14 bytes just to say get slash HTTP slash 1.1. We got more bytes in an overhead just in the first line. And then we got this blob of headers. We got like uh, you know several hundred bytes of headers. And then finally, the payload. And if it's a multi-part form request, we have all this overhead with the boundaries. It's a lot of extra bytes to be sent. WebSocket says, let's be as lean as possible and just have a little bit of overhead. And most of the time, we're only going to have six to six or eight bytes of overhead in these things. Most of what you're sending using WebSockets is your messages themselves. Uh, this is why, I, in my opinion, I think WebSockets has a lot of staying power just for that fact. I, I don't see WebSockets being replaced anytime soon, because what are you going to do that's better than that? You're just keeping the TCP connection open, and you have minimal overhead. Like, What can you do that's better? Like if Somebody can think of something better than that. What are they going to do? Like chop off one byte of overhead? Uh, there's not really too much you can do. We'll talk about WebRTC, which is another streaming protocol, uh, but that's going to be for peer-to-peer -peer connections, and typically works over UDP. It's a different uh, different idea. It's not solving the same problem. Uh, I think WebSockets are, are usually here to stay. Are here to stay. Um, all right. So let's talk about. Uh, in, let me, I'll, I'll qualify that a little bit. So in two years, if they get replaced, I'm not uh, called out on it. There are some HTTP-based protocols, which, I, you know what? Are they even solving the same problem? That do leave the TCP connection open. Like, any protocol that's going to try to replace WebSockets is effectively doing the same thing. Like they're, they're just doing the same thing. There are HTTP new protocols that are keeping the connection alive and just sending multiple requests and responses over that, and also allowing server-side pushes on the same TCP connection. So I guess the only improvement is sending HTTP requests and uh, server pushes on the same TCP connection instead of having multiple connections. Uh, maybe that'll replace WebSockets, but uh, in my opinion, very minimal gains to be had there. So let's talk about protocols just for a second. So protocols, aside from like HTTP and uh, multi-part form parts and the protocols that we've, we've worked with, uh, the protocols IP and TCP specifically that we I flashed at the beginning of the semester, they're just a way to say, this is how the bytes are organized. And this is what each bit means in the message. And they're very ordered. Uh, as opposed to like HTTP, it's all based on string parsing, uh, how to parse the headers. A lot of protocols are, if you send a message, what do the bits mean in their positional order? So this allows us to communicate over the internet and just send bytes over the internet. That's all we can do is send bytes over the internet, or technically bits, ones and zeros. And the protocol is going to assign meaning to those ones and zeros. So when this was IP and TCP, 
we said for an IP packet, the first four bits that you send are going to be the IP version number. The next four bits that you send are, is going to be the IHL. So I'm a server on the internet, or, or a router on the internet. I'm a router on the internet, and I get an IP packet. I read bytes off of a connection, and I see some bytes. I know that I'm an IP router. Uh, I'm an internet router, so I'm expecting this to be an IP uh, packet. I'm going to read the first four bits, the first four ones and zeros that come in, and I'm going to interpret that as the HTTP version number. And that's going to tell me how to parse the rest of this. What, uh, I'm going to look up my protocol for that version and then parse the rest of this based on that. So just the order of the bits. The next four bits is going to be the IHL. The next byte is going to be the type of service. The next two bytes is going to be the total length. And just by the order of the ones and zeros, I'm just going to take section them. These four, these four, et cetera. That's what these protocols are telling us is what order the bytes, uh, based on the position of the bits, this, this is what those bits are going to mean. So if the sender of that packet and the routers of the internet are both speaking this protocol properly, the sender is going to say, OK, I need the version number. That's going to be the first four bits. The IHL, that'll be the next four bits, et cetera, and construct their IP datagram that way in the proper format with everything in the proper places then the routers of the internet are going to be able to parse that information by looking at the same order, being programmed to look at that same order by implementing the same protocol. And then we're able to effectively use the internet because everybody's speaking that protocol. Same with TCP. TCP is going to say, OK, the first two bytes are the source port. The next two bytes are the destination port. Then we have a four byte sequence. Our sequence number is really that big. Holy crap. Uh, a four. Yeah, that's a lot. Is that necessary? Uh, that's that's a lot. That's uh, uh, so you can have a billion ish uh, packets for a single. I guess if you want to send a terabyte. Yeah, I guess I guess it's necessary. Uh, Maybe that's not even sufficient once things get really crazy. If you want to send several terabytes, uh, that might not even be enough. Um, the, the act number, that should be that big. And then uh, the rest of the stuff, I won't go through everything. So just by the order of the bits, that's how we're determining what information means what, what bits mean what, just by putting them in the proper order. And now we're going to do that same thing with WebSockets. So with IP and TCP, in this course, we just say import TCP. And then that library does, uh, does its thing. So those two protocols are handled for us. Whenever we say um, uh, self.request.sendall and ship it over the, um, uh, ship some bytes over the internet, the library is going to split that into several IP packets. It's going to add the TCP headers to each one. It's going to add the IP headers to each one. And then make sure your data re is uh, sent. And then handle any resend requests. If there was a dropped packet and the client sends a resend request, it's going to handle those resends. All that stuff is going to be, ha be handled for us by the libraries. But at the WebSocket protocol, this is an application level protocol, just like HTTP. This is where our applications are going to have to implement this. So this, at this level, we do actually have to care about these bits. So when you receive a WebSocket packet, or sorry, a WebSocket frame, the first bit is going to be the fin bit. The second bit is reserve one, then reserve two, reserve three, the opcode, the mask bit, seven bits of payload length, et cetera. And we want to talk about how to parse this all day today. So when we actually have a WebSocket frame going across the internet, we really can't get rid of the overhead of TCP and IP. We need those to be able to have reliable communication over the internet. Uh, but when we send a WebSocket packet over the internet, a WebSocket message, this is what's actually being sent over the internet. And possibly a whole bunch of these if we need to have multiple packets, if TCP needs to chop up our message into multiple packets. This is what the routers read. The routers are going to read the IP headers to figure out where to send this. Once it gets to the destination machine, that machine is going to read the TCP headers to figure out which process to send it to. And then once it gets to your process, 
All these headers are gone. Those are all removed from, uh, from the data. The, you don't need those headers anymore. And then you're going to get this as the first byte. And this is where you're going to start parsing. But this is how these things are sent over the internet. This is what we call the, uh, the network stack. We have the, uh, oh, I'm not going to remember the names. Uh, I was going to try to remember the names out the top of my head. Um, I haven't thought about them in a while. I usually hang out in the application layer, so I know that one. But application, does anybody know now that I kind of dug myself this hole? The tra uh, transport layer? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the transport uh, protocol. Um, the, what's, the what layer? Network. Network layer. And then above this is the physical layer, which is either Wi-Fi or Ethernet or, uh, you know, whatever else you have. Uh, I always remember physical layer for some reason. Uh, and then, of course, application layer, that's where we hang out. And there are a couple more that I don't remember. There's one that'll go right here in between TCP and WebSockets by the end of the, uh, by the, end of the semester, which will be our encryption, uh, our encryption, which I don't remember what that one's called either. I shouldn't have backed myself in that corner. I don't remember what they're called, um, what all the uh, layer names are. Take matter networking concepts. You'll definitely learn those, and it'll be on a quiz or a test for sure. Like you'll have to say these are the network stacks, uh, the layers of the network. <clears throat> uh, if that's not on there, they're they're missing uh, what they should be doing. I shouldn't say that because I don't have. We just established I don't have exams and quizzes. Um, but you should learn that stuff in that course. I should say. All right. Anyway, let's start parsing this thing. So every uh, every like you don't read the. How do I want to word that? Uh, when you get this data, you get a byte array. You can only read these things in chunks of eight bits. You can only read the bytes. I think that's, I'm struggling how to word that because I think that's pretty clear by now. You understand that we're communicating in bytes. But we're going to read this thing in eight bits at a time. And we do have to care that those eight bits, the languages and the computers are going to try to help us humans out. It's actually going to hurt us when we start parsing WebSockets. But they're going to try to help us humans out and convert those eight bits of binary into a decimal number. So if you print out a byte, you're going to get a number, or it's going to go even further and try to interpret it as ASCII. And if the most significant bit is not one, it'll just print out the ASCII character for you because it thinks, oh, you have some bytes, and you probably, you probably want this to be text. And it'll just try to convert it. Uh, and if it's not text, then you finally get the slash x and then the actual byte, uh, the actual hex values, which is what we really are interested in. So if you see those ASCII values printed to the screen, uh, even uh, just doing my solutions for the homework, I'm looking up my ASCII chart, what is that value? Uh, or you can, uh, that's when I'm lazy, or write some code to print it out in binary or hex, like we did way early in the semester when we talked about encodings. Uh, which I'll demo on Friday. So when you read off of the stream, you get a byte array. If you read the first byte, we're expecting that to be these values up to the opcode. So you have the first eight bits. You're going to read that. If you read the second byte, if you go, hey, byte array that I just read off my TCP socket of one, give me the second byte, you're going to get the mask bit and seven bits of payload length. So we're down to bit level parsing. We need to uh, pull out all of our bit level parsing tools, which you may or may not have actually used in code, uh, but you should at the very least understand the theory behind them, what uh, an XOR is, what an AND is, uh, what a mask is. You might not know what mask is, but I'll talk about masking. Um, you probably should, you've probably seen that, right? Um, masking. Anyway, we will definitely talk about masking in two different regards. So if you have an AND, uh, for example, uh, if I want the opcode, I read the first byte, and I want to grab the four bits of the opcode, what I'm going to do is do a logical AND, which is just a single ampersand in most languages. Uh, this is why we use double ampersand for logical AND. Single ampersand is reserved for bitwise operations. 
uh, a single ampersand and then give it a bit mask. I'm going to mask out the bits that I am interested in. And 15, I know is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. So I know 15 is this, or rather, I'm interested in the last four bits, the least significant four bits. So I'm going to write that in binary, convert it to decimal, and end my first byte with 15. And that's going to mask out the opcode. That's going to give me only the opcode. So if I end with a bitwise and with 0, fin and 0, I don't care what it is, it's going to be 0 for all these. And then 1 and opcode is just going to give me the opcode. And now I have a value ranging from 0 to 15, which is going to tell me the opcode. If the opcode is then 15, I know the opcode is 1111. If the opcode is 8, I know the opcode is 1000. If the opcode is 1, I know it's 0001. Uh, and that's going to be very handy, masking things. Uh, and also bit shifts I find pretty useful. Uh, but masking bits is going to be important when you need to get just these four bits out of a single byte. So let's go through these and talk about what each bit actually represents. Uh, the fin bit, the very first one, is 1 if this is the last frame of a message, and 0 if it's not the last frame of a message. Uh, for your homework, you can always assume this is 1. I don't care if you don't even check it. You can just assume that the fin bit is going to be 1. It's always going to be 1. Uh, I don't even know the situations where it's going to be 0. I believe it's when the client itself is buffering, when it's trying to get more data from, uh, from the client, and it wants to send what it has first. Um, but even that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, because the server could just buffer uh, on their end. I don't know. Uh, or if it's a streaming protocol, but again, why not just split it into multiple frames? I, I don't understand the situations where this would be 0. Uh, but anyway, for our purposes, the browser is always going to set this to 1. And you can safely assume that in your homework. For any of the, my front end code that I gave you in the homework, it's always going to be 1. The reserve bits, you can assume, are always going to be 0. This RSV stands for reserve. Uh, you can assume those are all going to be 0. This is future proofing the protocol a bit. The protocol reserves these bits for special cases. So if anybody wants to add uh, different protocols to WebSockets and say, set the reserve bits to 001, and that uh, specifies that the headers are a little bit different or whatever, um, these bits can be used. Uh, they're just reserved for any future use, any use that we might have. We're just using straight up WebSockets. So we're going to assume that these are 0 again in your homework. If you don't want to parse the reserve bits, I'm not making you. Uh, you can just assume they're 0, 0, 0. It would just be one extra bit of parsing and then having a conditional. If reserve bits are 0, then keep doing your thing. If fin bit is 1, keep doing your thing. Uh, it, it's, it's just not that interesting. And if you don't have that code, there's no consequences for you. So I'm just going to be open and say, you know, you ain't got to parse it. The opcode is the first one that we do have to parse. So the 4-bit opcode is going to specify what type of frame this is, what type of data is being sent, or any special instructions for this frame. There are two that we're going to be concerned about in our homework. 0001 means this frame contains textual information. And 1000, which says, Closing this connection. So if you get a, an opcode of 1000, you should sever that connection, close the TCP connection. You're done with that client. The client uh, is done with you. Uh, don't try to parse that frame using your parsing code, because you're going to get errors, because it's not going to have any of the stuff that you're going to expect. Uh, a close request, just sever the connection and don't parse that frame. If it's 0001, you're going to parse the frame. You're going to go through all the stuff we're going to talk about in the rest of the lecture and extract the payload out of the frame. I forgot to watch chat. Uh, 14 bits or bytes? 14 bytes of overhead. Yeah, for TCP, you have to check out uh, modern networking concepts. I have limited TCP knowledge. I have a working TCP knowledge to be able to get web sockets, uh, web servers uh, working. And anything else that I 
don't have to learn about TCP. I only have a very surface knowledge of. So I'm not the one to ask about TCP. Yeah, payload length extended, payload length extended, extended, payload length continued. Do you actually have to implement the TCP handshake in modern networking concepts? I hope you do, actually. It could be. Somebody said, gotta love the TCP handshake. It'd be neat if you had to code that up. We need handshakes to use the internet. COVID is where we absolutely needed the handshakes. <laughs> The TCP handshakes instead of in-person handshakes. Yeah, the, the opcodes are each time you receive a WebSocket frame, which is a WebSocket message. So like WebSocket frame is similar to HTTP requests. The, you, the client's going to send you one WebSocket frame, and that's going to be a, you know, a chunk of bytes. The opcode will be for that one single frame. Now, the user can send another frame after that, which you're going to start over all your parsing code again, and that opcode might be different. So, for example, they're going to send text. Here's a message for the chat. Here's a message for the chat. Thinking of objective two, here's a message for the chat. Uh, here's a request to close the connection. So you'll get a different opcode at that last one. So, for example, when you close a browser tab, that browser is going to send an opcode of 1000 to your server, which says, hey, we're closing. If you don't handle that close correctly, if you try to parse it as a text, as a, a message for the chat, your code's going to break. You're going to get errors in your server because it's not structured the same way. <clears throat> there won't be any payload. Like there, there won't be anything there. Uh, there might be some payload. I saw two bytes of payload when I was testing, but it's not going to have everything that you expect. It's going to break. All right, next, the mask bit. Again, there are a lot of assumptions you can make uh, on this one. Uh, the mask bit's always going to be one. So the mask bit is an indication of whether this frame is masked or not. If the mask bit is one, that means the payload is masked and that this masking key exists. If it's zero, this masking key does not exist and the payload is not masked. And we'll talk about what masking means. Uh, there's two applications of masking that we're using today. Uh, one, the using a log, um, bitwise and, and the next one, we're actually going to use a bitwise XOR. So two different instances of masking, two different, kind of overloading the, the term uh, today, uh, talking about two different uses of the word masking. Uh, but you can assume this is always one when the client sends you a message. The client will always mask their data. And when you send frames from your server, always set this to zero and do not include a masking key. Do I not talk about, why do I not talk about masking right there? Uh, I'll, uh, apparently my other masking slides are later. How did I not catch that? Uh, but I'll talk about masking just a little bit because uh, I want to talk about it right now. Uh, masking is going to take these four bytes and XOR it with each four bytes of your payload data. Uh, the client's always going to send messages like that. Always, always, always. Every browser is going to mask their WebSocket frames and send them. And the reason they do that is not just to make us do more work in our parsing, but they do that to circumvent aggressive caching. Just like we have the key and accept for the handshake, uh, this masking is to avoid aggressive caching from caching our TCP connection uh, data and... Uh, and messing us up like that. I don't know why anything would cache the raw TCP bytes, but just in case they do, I'm sure there, there must be some that do because it made it into the protocol. Uh, we're going to avoid the caching like that. All right, content length or payload length is very similar to content length, and we do have to read this. We have to read this content length for a few reasons in this homework. So the, cont the payload length is variable. This is going to take some parsing. We have three different situations here. The payload length can either be 7 bits, 16 bits, or 64 bits, depending on the actual payload length, the actual length of the payload. So if the length of the payload is less than 126 bytes, then the payload length is represented in 7 bits. 
just these seven bits. So, and this is another way where WebSockets trying to squeeze every byte of overhead out of this thing, trying to get every byte of overhead gone. Uh, if the payload is less than 126 bytes, the payload length, we're only going to use seven bits. We only need seven bits to represent these values, uh, any value up to 127. So if it's less than 126, 125 or less, those seven bits are just the payload length. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six bytes of overhead, very lean messages that we're sending over the internet, very lean. So you read those seven bits, it's anything other than 126 or 127. You got yourself your payload length, interpret that as an integer, and that's how many bytes of payload you have. So in that case, pretty easy to parse. You just take those seven bits and parse them. Make sure you get rid of the mask bit. So mask out the mask bit by anding this with uh, 127 to, uh, to uh, zero out the most significant bit is what you want to do there. <clears throat> if the payload length is greater than or equal to 126, but less than 65K, then we have a different situation. For this, to communicate that, the payload length, the seven bit payload length here, is going to be exactly 126. So if that payload length is exactly 126, that's the way of signaling, hey, there's some, you know, there's some more bits that we need to represent the payload length. If it's exactly 126, then the next two bytes are going to be the payload length. So the next 16 bits, we're saying, okay, we got a larger message here. We need some more uh, room to fit the payload length. We're going to use two extra bytes and represent the payload length there. And we can represent payload lengths up to 2 to the 16 minus 1. So anything less than 2 to the 16 is going to be able to fit in those two bytes. So we have another conditional. So if that 7-bit payload length is less than 126, that's your payload length. Else if that payload length equals 126, read the next two bytes, which gets a little tricky in the code. You have to read the two bytes and combine them into a single int. Uh, so looking up libraries to be able to do that, or, or the way to do it in your language of choice. And if the payload length is greater than 65K, if, uh, then this payload length is going to be exactly 127, all ones. And that's our indication that, hey, we got a pretty big message here. We got a pretty big payload length. Uh, so now the next eight bytes are going to be the payload length. All of this is going to be payload length when we have a pretty large message. So with 64 bits to represent that payload length, we can represent values up to 2 to the 64 minus 1, which is like 16 exabytes, which is a lot. WebSockets, uh, they really wanted to future-proof these frames. They learned their lessons from IPv4, and they said, you know what, let's future-proof this as much as we can. If somebody wants to send more than 16 exabytes of data in a single frame, you know, they're just going to have to chop that up into two WebSocket frames or however many they need. Um, but in a single WebSocket frame, you can fit over up to 16 exabytes, which, again, is part of my wondering, like, why would the fin bit ever be zero? Like, you can send 16 exabytes at a time. Uh, what are you doing where you're like, hey, I still got more data to send after that 16 exabytes. This isn't the last message. Uh, so it's got to be, like, buffering things or streaming when the fin is zero. Uh, and we won't test with anything larger than 16 exabytes because we would break WebSockets. Uh, we will test over 65K, though. We will test all three of these. That's something we haven't done in the past, um, but will happen this semester. Because I, I would say, oh, you should still handle this, but, you know, just for simplicity, we're not going to test it, you know, whatever. Um, and then nobody would implement the 127 thing, so... We will test for that this semester. So, so just to recap again, read this seven bits. If that value is less than 126, or yeah, 126, then that's your payload length. End of story. Read the message. 
For test two, that's all you need to handle. You can get full credit on test two, just handling that. And then, or uh, task, um, objective two. And then objective three says, OK, let's add some more features to this. Uh, then you have to say, if it's exactly 126, read the next 16 bits, two bytes as the link. If it's exactly 127, read the next 64 bits, or eight bytes as the length. <clears throat> so that's payload length. And then, of course, that's how many bytes of payload. So flashbacks to homework two. Oh, some of you are still working on homework two, aren't you? But uh, <laughs> flash, flash four to homework two for some of you. Uh, <laughs> um, when you're doing your buffering, uh, if the payload's quite large, read the payload length check to make sure you've read that many bytes of payload. And while you haven't read that many bytes, enter your buffering state and keep reading from the TCP socket until you have payload length number of bytes. So same thing that you're doing for homework too, that buffering is not going away. Buffering is a very important topic in the internet. Uh, we buffer a lot. Uh, you have to enter a buffering state to be able to read the more payload. So especially when we're testing over 65K, if we send you a, a one megabyte payload, uh, you'll have to buffer for a while. You have to be able to handle those uh, those messages. We won't go quite up to 16 exabytes, but we'll uh, we'll send over. You know, we'll make sure you're handling the 127 case. Okay, now my masking slides. I don't know why I put this out of order. What, what was I thinking? Um, so masking. If the mask bit is one. Then the next four bytes, oh, I, I know why I did it, because it goes in byte order. Uh, so now we're talking about the bytes after the payload. So if the mask bit is one, then the four bytes after the payload, regardless of how many bytes the payload took up, the next four bytes are going to be the masking key. So if the payload length is less than 126, your masking key is right here, these four bytes right here. If you needed the full eight bytes of payload length, then the masking key is where it is visually right here. And that's why you have these dash lines. Some of these bytes might, may or may not exist. They might not be there. Uh, the whole masking key itself is not even there when you're sending messages. So if you're sending a message from your server that's less than 126 bytes, then you have your two bytes of overhead, and then the very next byte is your payload goes right into your payload. And then you only have two bytes of overhead. <clears throat> so if so, regardless of what the payload length is, how many bytes it takes, the next four bytes after payload are going to be the masking key. And this is going to be four bytes always. Uh, this is when you're parsing messages. The client is always going to send you a masking bit of one. Uh, the next four bytes are going to be the masking key. You're going to read these four bytes. These are random bytes generated by the user, generated by the client, generated by the browser, uh, purely random, or maybe they have some protocol to generate these things. I don't know. I don't care. Uh, to us, they're going to be random bytes. And then the payload is XORed with the masking key. Each four bytes of payload are XORed with the masking key to mask the payload. So what you have to do when you read the payload, you'll read the masking key, read the payload data, and then each four bytes, XOR it with the masking key again. So if you have your bytes of data and you XOR it with some random data twice, it's effectively going to cancel out, and it's going to get you back to your original data. So we want to get back to the original payload by masking by XORing with the masking key again. And I recommend doing this one byte at a time. So instead of doing it like how I just explained it, take four bytes of payload, XOR it with the masking key, take the next four bytes of payload, XOR it with the masking key. Uh, that can get tricky when you get to the end. You have to have four different conditions. Do I, um, do I have an even multiple of four? Do I have a multiple of four mon minus one, minus two, minus three? There are four different cases you would have to handle, and it's kind of a pain. Uh, painful to do. Instead, iterate over the bytes of the payload and XOR one byte at a time. And for each byte, ask yourself, <clears throat> ask yourself which byte of the pay, uh, which byte of the masking key does this need to be XORed with? 
So pull out your module arithmetic and ask yourself, uh, write some code, what byte of the masking key does this need to be XORed with? XOR it, and then go to the next one. If you do one byte at a time, you don't care what the length of the payload is, what, if it's a multiple of four or not, uh, just handle it one byte at a time. That's my recommendation for that. Uh, as an example, if you have this as your message, and you have some random mask of this, the payload is going to be, for those four bytes of payload, is going to be this XOR this, this XOR this zero, this XOR this one, et cetera. I'm not going to go through all of XOR, but this is the random mask XORed with this four bytes of payload. And if I XOR this masked payload with the mask again, I'm going to get zero XOR zero zero one XOR zero one and go through the whole thing. You can verify that this is exactly the original message. So if we XOR something twice, they're going to cancel each other out and we get right back to the original message. So it's a way to have the data look scrambled to circumvent the, uh, circumvent the caching, any aggressive caching that might be done, um, but still be able to simply get back to the original message with an XOR operation. I say simply in terms of computation. XOR is a very fast operation. <clears throat> Was that white space? Is it just nothing? Last line of, of what? Oh, the underscore? What is the white space? This underscore, you mean? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's just for visualization. I want to separate the bytes. Uh, that's just for us humans to, to be able to see. That, that has no actual meaning. I just wanted to, I don't know why I didn't just do spaces looking at it. Um, but that's just to separate. Oh, I know why I didn't do space, because that's how I do it in the code. That's how I was printing out bytes in my code. Uh, but that just means uh, the bytes are separated, just visually. Yeah, what? Well, should have changed those to spaces for the slides, I think. What's up, Ren? <clears throat> and once you XOR all the payload data with the masking key, you're ready to read your message, and then it's, you know, it, it's, uh, we're only handling text, we're not handling bytes, so you don't have to worry about not converting it to, uh, to a string. Uh, you have to work in bits anyway, so I, I got you working in, in bytes and bits anyway. Uh, I don't have to force you to do that by uploading images. Um, but once you have this XOR, you can parse it as a string. They're going to be JSON strings for the homework, so that's where you would have your JSON parsing libraries and get all the information out of this and do whatever you're going to do with that message. In each case, you're going to take that message, uh, process it in one way or another. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you don't even have to process it. And then send it to other clients for the chat feature in Objective 2. You get a message from a user. You're going to parse the message, parse the JSON, uh, put it in a different format, and then broadcast it to every user, including the sender. So we do need to send frames after that. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about sending frames, except your mask bit is going to be zero. Your masking key will not exist. You'll go right into payload data after the payload, and you won't mask your payload. The fin bit will be one, the reserve bits will be zero, the opcode will be zero, 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 one. So that, you already know your first byte. Mask bit will be zero, and then payload length, you have to do the reverse of what you did for parsing. If your payload length is less than 126, a 7-bit payload length is fine. If it's more than that, you have to decide, do I need 2 bytes or 8 bytes to be able to represent that payload length? So you do have to do the opposite of the payload length to be able to write this frame, and then go right into your payload data unmasked after the payload length. Do not mask. Uh, and the reason for that, there's no caching. Like a server sending data to the client, uh, nobody's going to cache that. Uh, that doesn't, just doesn't make sense. Uh, you want, whenever the server's sending information to a client, it's because you want the client to receive that information. There's nothing in the middle that says, hey, you already sent this to the client. We're, we're, not, we're just not going to send it to them. Um, doesn't quite make sense the same way as um, the client sending something to the server. The server doesn't need to know every message that the client sends. 
If you're just requesting my home page, you know, that can be cached if I'm not templating. Uh, that can be cached. But sending from the server to the client, the client needs to get all that information. So just to get you started a little bit on the homework, this first byte, you know a lot about this. The fin bit's always one, the reserve bits are always zero, and the opcode is either one or eight. So your first byte that you read is always going to be either 129 or 136. You know that that's going to be the case. You could read that first byte and check. If it's one of those two, if it's 136, I know that it's going to be a, uh, a request to close the connection. If it's 129, I know that I have some parsing to do, and I need to extract this message and handle it however I'm going to handle it. Uh, just, so just to kind of put things in context. So you can mask things. Like when you get to the payload link, you have to do some masking. But the first byte, you can kind of shortcut a little. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend that because you'll get some practice. The first byte's pretty easy to parse. You'll get some practice with parsing. When you get to the payload link, things get trickier. So if you go into payload link without any practice doing bitwise manipulation, it's just going to be a little tougher. Um, but, uh, but just to show you what that first byte's going to look like. Mass bit zero, determine your payload length, mass bit zero, no mass exists. I already said that stuff. Any questions? Anybody have questions? Not in chat? Like I get when when we get original meshes, but how does that avoid caching? Yeah, because no, yeah, exactly. No two messages with the masking, no two messages that the client send are going to look identical. Uh, within, they would have to send the same message, and uh, then there's a two to the 32 chance, one and two to the 32 chance that they'll look identical. Uh, so basically, no chance. Uh, but if somebody spams like the same message over and over, and you're not masking, it's going to look like the same message over and over, and that might get cached, and we might not get that message. Which I guess in that example wouldn't be the worst thing. Uh, what is the purpose of XORing the mask? That, that was just talked about right above what you, when you said that. Uh, it's to avoid caching. Uh, oh, we only got a minute left, too. And I, I created the, the assignment in Autolab this time. Didn't forget. Hopefully, I don't forget anymore. I created Fridays, too, just so I'm ahead of things. But you can't see Fridays yet. Yeah, so if, if the extra payload bytes are not needed, they will be completely skipped. They won't be zeroed out. They just won't exist. They won't be there. So if you only need seven bits for the payload link, right after those seven bits, the masking key starts. Or if you're sending a message, that's when the payload starts, right after those seven bits. Uh, and in Friday's demos, I'll show you, like, I'll run my server, and I'll print out the bits of the WebSocket frames. I'll make it more clear. All right, uh, once you're done with the question, go. It's um, one more day until spring break. I'll see you all Friday, and have a great day.